first scripture reading for today comes from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. I'll be reading from the NRSV. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And then from Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is a reading from God's Holy Word. begin where we ended the last time uh, that I preached. We concluded the, the sermon by making our prayer a song. We sang, thank you, Lord, for saving uh, my soul. Thank you, Lord, for giving me thy great salvation, so rich and free. And I read somewhere one time that the person who sings prays twice. Uh, so if you remember the words that you sing with me as our prayer this morning. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Lord, I pray that you would take my words and you would use them for your glory and your honor to proclaim your gospel. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would find acceptance in your sight. God, who is our strength and our review. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Today we conclude a three-part sermon series on gratitude with grateful hearts. Uh, and obviously this was intentional to coincide with Thanksgiving and our annual stewardship campaign, which ends today. My thinking was that leading up to this holiday when we as a nation are supposed to give thanks, that we would give great thought to what it means to truly be a grateful person. And of course, for a Christian, every day is supposed to be Thanksgiving, and so it, it extends beyond the Thanksgiving day. It extends into all the holidays and every day. So the first week, I talked about the benefits of uh, giving thanks. Uh, we talked about medical research, and we considered the scriptures. We considered that uh, from research that people who give thanks regularly are healthier, happier, they have more friends, they do better in school, they perform better in their jobs, so on and so forth. They have a deeper spiritual life. We talked about how being grateful leads to generosity, and how being generous leads to gratitude, and that the two are inseparable. I shared one study that showed that people who are generous, even if they're just a little generous, it said, have healthier hearts. And I said that generosity was as good for your cardiac health as exercise, and some of you have taken that too literally. And now I have to retract it. Of course you have to exercise. It was sarcasm. I've had every medical professional in this church on me since I made that comment. Generosity does help. Last week, Pastor Kathy talked about giving thanks in all circumstances, especially when you're walking through tough times, especially when it feels like you're walking through hell. Uh, we heard about her recollection of November 6th and everything that happened, and someday I'll share with you my recollection of November 6th, um, but that's for a different sermon. Gratitude, she taught, helps us cope. 
It keeps us from losing our minds to, to help us be grounded in what's really important. So today, to wrap it up, we're talking about cultivating gratitude. And my hope is that Thanksgiving isn't just another day for us, but as followers of Jesus, that Thanksgiving is every day. But how do we begin to cultivate that? How do we cultivate a harvest of gratitude in our lives? In the midst of the, the passages we read, both from the Apostle Paul in Philippians and in Colossians, Paul says simply, be thankful. He's saying that we need to form our hearts and our minds in gratitude. And I want this to be an essential part of who you are. As human beings, you were meant to be grateful. Re research has shown that there are certain things that we can do to rewire our brains, to reform ourselves as grateful people. And, and we do that with gratitude by continually practicing gratitude. Many studies show us it takes about 28 days of a continual action for it to become a part of who you are. So one of the things that we asked you to do uh, throughout the sermon series was to keep a gratitude journal. How many people have done that faithfully? How many people tried really, really hard? <laughs> and as you flip through these pages, whether they're, whether they're full, you've done it every day, or whether you tried really hard and some days worked and some days didn't, do you feel happier when you flip through this? Of course you do. Here, that's, that's just one example of something we can do to cultivate gratitude. So this morning I'm going to give you a few other examples of things that we can do to cultivate gratitude in your heart and your mind so that you might live gratefully. There was a study done through the Templeton Foundation several years ago about Americans and how they relate to gratitude. They concluded this, quote, Americans think gratitude is important. They're just not very good at expressing it. So there's a gap, they're saying, between what we believe about gratitude and how much we actually do it. D digging down deeper, they noted that 44% of men regularly express thanks to other people. That means 56% of men don't. Women fared a little bit better. 52% of women regularly express thanks, but that means that 48% don't even though almost 100% of people think that gratitude is important. So here's the question, is there a gratitude gap in your life? Is there a gap between what you believe and how frequently you express it? In that survey, they asked different types of people who they were most likely to thank and who they were least likely to thank. Most likely, naturally, are a person's own immediate family. The two groups least likely to be thanked, bosses, we expect our bosses to thank us, but we don't always think about thanking them. The other group, the least likely group of people to be thanked. Anybody have an idea? TSA workers. <laughs> so here's the suggestion. If you work, try to find one thing this week to thank your boss for, Daniel. Uh, and, and, and how about the next time you're at the airport? Tell the TSA worker that's checking your bag or giving you that very soft touch pat down. Thank you. Thanks for what you do for keeping our airways safe. Now, there's a really good group from this church traveling to the Holy Land at the end of January, and I'll be watching you and how you relate to the TSA workers. Just see what happens when, when you do that, when you, when you go out of your way to, to thank someone uh, for especially something that's a thankless kind of job and the difference that it might make in someone's life. What do you think it might do to that grouchy TSA worker if someone went through and said, thank you for what you do? I bet that almost never happens. The survey suggests that it almost never happens. Who are the people in your life that just aren't thanked enough? We want to give you an opportunity to do that uh, here at church. You, probably if you read the announcements, you saw an announcement this morning or in emails this week. We've got a lot of workers hanging around our building right now. Um, and you know, that, that clutter outside, the mudslides, the work equipment, it, it is inconvenient. And it can be frustrating. But I watch these guys every day, I interact with them, and they're working really hard to make the dream that we've had as a church a reality. They've been, they've been working in rain and snow and less than ideal building conditions to pour a new parking lot to build our family life center. Yeah, I know we're paying them, but how might it bless and impact their lives if we were very intentional about saying thank you? So that announcement in your bulletin, you'll see that we're trying to organize some snacks and even meals to, to bless and thank these guys. And uh, when that opportunity came up, I, I knew the sermon was coming and Brittany and I wanted to lead by example. So we served work we served lunch to the workers on Friday. 
We, we have Italian beef and, and Brittany's homemade mac and cheese, which it should be classified as a drug. Um, <laughs> and I told them that we just wanted to thank them and bless them, and, and they, were, they were so grateful. I imagine they, they went outside and they felt better about the work that they were doing. And you know what? I felt better too. If that's something you're interested in, Peg Ramsey's contact information is there. Uh, she's coordinating this and helping people to get scheduled to, to bless these guys, to say thank you. Another thing you can do is by writing thank you notes. Some of you in this congregation are really, really good at that. Brittany taught me the value of this right after we got married. We were back from our honeymoon like five minutes, and she had a stack of thank you cards and started writing to everyone that gave us a gift, and it took me like a year uh, to, to get through them. I think some people probably never actually got one that were on my list, and I feel badly about that now. Because by her example, I've come to love writing thank yous. I love on Monday mornings getting the list of people who have visited one of our services for the first time and writing them a thank you note for, uh, for, for being here. Uh, I love writing thank you notes when I see someone going above and beyond in their service to their church. I, I love receiving thank you notes. I've told you before that I have a, a blue folder that I put those thank you notes in. When I'm feeling down, I pull them out and read them and remind myself why I do what I do. There was a study, I think it was the University of Texas, they asked people that were struggling with depression and anxiety to write thank yous to people who had impacted their lives once a week for three weeks. And after doing this for three weeks, they, they noted marked improvement in depression and in the development of coping skills related to anxiety. And think of what good that does. Instead of focusing on what's bad, we realize that there are people who have impacted us. Instead of thinking about the people who have hurt us, we realize that there are people who have blessed us. They found that writing these notes three weeks in a row had a lasting impact 12 weeks later. I saw a video this week from a group called Soul Pancake that just confirmed this study. They brought people in and they had them write a thank you note to someone who had positively impacted their life and describe in detail what that person had done to impact them. They came in thinking that they were going to share their letters with a group of other people who had written them, but instead they were brought in individually and asked to call that person they'd written the thank you note to on the spot and read it to them right there. Now, I watched this whole really long video. I'm going to share with you just a portion of it. It was striking to me, though, the impact that these thank yous had, not just on the person who heard the thank you, but on the person who wrote it. Have a look. Is everything okay? Yes, but I have to read this out loud to you. The person who has had the biggest impact on my life outside of Jesus Christ, who is responsible for my existence, was my college accounting instructor. He had a joy and enthusiasm for his job like no other teacher I have ever known. I love her to death and she keeps me going with positive talk. She is a woman that knows what she wants and won't give up until it is achieved. Oh, it sounds good. I, I, I don't know what, I'm about to cry because that's so beautiful. I, 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 have, I have to say that it's just wonderful. I first met Craig on an independent feature film set in Whitefish, Montana. I recently have been sending Craig a lot of positive thoughts as he's suffered a series of health problems. Despite his medical problems, he's continued to work and take pleasure in the small things in life, like sitting quietly with, with his wife Janine on the porch. Erica is my older sister and my best friend. <laughs> Sometimes it even feels like we are twins. She's my number one fan and my number one supporter. She makes me happy because despite all my mistakes and my decisions, she still loves me no matter what. Your friendship is everything. And you are, you are one of the most important person in my life. Even when she has a kid and many children, I will love her more than her kids. Okay, maybe not. I will never forget when she flew 3,000 miles to the drop of a phone call to save me from a breakup. I'm being blessed by having a son like you. I love you. Bye. Why did you do this to me? <laughs> I don't know because they made me do it. <laughs> Thank you for picking up. Bye, sweetie. You see the, the impact that, that it had on the face of the person who was reading it? In the one case, you heard mom talking back throughout the whole thing about how blessed she was to have a son like him. And, uh, the impact that it had both ways. So here's what I want you to do. As we head to Thanksgiving this week, I want you to write a letter to someone who's blessed and impacted your life and sit, actually send it to them. Whether that's a snail mail or a text message or a Facebook message, just get that to them. 
This is how we cultivate gratitude. It's a pattern for gratitude to make sure that we give thanks to people. The journal was a, was a pattern to remember what you're grateful for. Let's talk about another one we talked about the first week, gratitude and generosity. This week, obviously, is Thanksgiving. How much time on Thanksgiving do you actually devote to gratitude? I can tell you what usually happens in our family. Uh, Brittany and I will load the girls up and we'll travel to my grandmother's and 20 or so of us will cram into her little house. And I'm the preacher of the family and though no one else ever prays before a meal, it's impressed upon me to do that uh, every Thanksgiving. Uh, so I, I pray for probably less than a minute and then that's it, it's off to the races. <laughs> we gorge ourselves, we watch football, we catch up on the latest family gossip. But that prayer is often the only time that we devote to gratitude. Then after we've let our food digest a little bit, uh, when everybody else is getting ready for round two, Brittany and I will load the kids up and we'll head to her family's and we'll do it all over again for dinner. Then most of the nation will move into Black Friday sales before the food's even cold. And I, I find it interesting that we're supposed to stop and give thanks for what we have, but then as a nation we instantly move to acquiring what we don't have. We go from Thanksgiving Thursday to Covenant's Friday. There's nothing wrong with, with the acquisition of stuff. It just seems like it's, it's whiplash the way it changes. There's nothing wrong with any of my Apple devices, but I know that there's going to be a really good sale on the newest iPhone Pro at a really nice discount, and I really want it. But Brittany already told me no. <laughs> so I decided that this year I'm going to linger on the gratefulness for what I have a little bit longer since she's so mean. Um, that's not true. Maybe all of us could linger on the gratefulness for what we already have just a little bit longer. What's the number one question that kids will be asked between now and Christmas Eve? What do you want for Christmas? And it's an interesting question for a holiday that celebrates a child who was born homeless in the first century equivalent of a parking garage, who would become a refugee in Egypt, who would grow up to die on behalf of humanity before he reached his 35th birthday. What more do you want for Christmas? It's not a bad question to ask. I love buying gifts for my friends and family. There's great joy in that giving. I love receiving gifts. But I think somewhere in the season, we could all be sharing gifts while also increasing contentment and gratitude for what we already have and asking, how do we give to people who might actually need more? So again, we want to give you some, some practical opportunities to practice that this holiday season. You have a full color uh, insert in your bulletin. We wanted to, to catch your eye. Uh, on, on one side of it, there is a reverse advent calendar. Now, mostly advent calendars are something we take something out of. All these sold wine advent calendars this year, and they sold out in less than five minutes nationwide. What does that tell you? Uh, on this reverse advent calendar, uh, instead of taking something out of the calendar, you're going to put something in. Every day of Advent, Advent starts next Sunday, there's a food item to place into a box and bring it with you on Christmas Eve to one of our three services, and we're going to donate it to the Tremont Food Pantry. It's a, it's a tangible way for your gratitude and generosity to work together to bless someone else. Um, and on the back side of that, it talks about our Christmas Eve offering. We always have a great offering on Christmas Eve. Some of it stays here for ministry in this church, but, over, but half of it is given away. We divide it three, three different ways. Down the hall, something here in our church, around the corner, something in our community, and around the globe. So you can see the way that's broken down this year. Uh, 25, down the hall, 25% of our Christmas Eve offering will support our youth and children's activities. Kids Club, Ignite, Roots, Anthem. And then 25% of our offering will go to support our Family Life Center project. Around the corner, here in our own community, 25% of our Christmas Eve offering will go to support the PTO Playground Project at Tremont Grade School. I don't know if you've seen the video for that yet or, or uh, the slide into the future, things they got. This is going to be a really cool playground and I can't wait to play on it. Um, and, and it's all being done through, through, through the PTO, and we have an opportunity to support that and bless our, our community and around the world. We've been supporting with our noisy offerings, our conference, our kids, and we're going to give 25% of our Christmas Eve offering uh, to that. It is to endow the spiritual life programs at, at the 10 children's agencies that are related to the United Methodist Church uh, in our state. You know some of them, Cunningham, Babyful, Chaddock. Uh, there's more. These are all uh, to, to help impoverished children, to help children who are orphans. Um, 
And through the state budget impasse a few years ago, one of the things that changed is money that comes from the state can no longer be used to pay staff who are related to spiritual life programs. And every one of these places, we feel as a conference, it's really important to have a pastor at, to have a chaplain who can share the love of Christ with the children who are part of these ministries. Otherwise, how is it a Christian ministry? So our conference, our kids, it creates a permanent endowment that will make sure that as long as those places exist, there will be a spiritual life program, there will be a pastor to share Jesus with those kids. It's, it's a practical way for us to bless other people. The reverse Advent calendar, our Christmas Eve offering, generosity leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to generosity. The two are inseparable. You, you know this, but we're trying to give you concrete, practical ways to, to close that gratitude gap. Because often we know how important gratitude is. We're just not all that great at expressing it. And the most major way that I can think of for us to cultivate gratitude, to close that gratitude gap, is through worship and prayer. When, when we gather for worship, we're not here to see a show or a production or to listen to the best speaker in Illinois. I don't know who that is. You're here to express gratitude to God, to humble yourself before the God who was and who is and who has yet to come. Every time we gather, we pray and we say thanks. We, we give our offerings as a way of saying thank you. We sing songs about thanks. Worship cultivates gratitude. We take an hour each Sunday to stop and say thanks to God. After the sermon, we get the opportunity to make our giving commitments for 2020, showing our gratitude for God for for all that he's given us as we sow into the ministry of this local congregation, believing that God can transform the world through what we do here. We do this through our daily prayers, short but powerful prayers of saying thanks. I, I, I tried to count it up that and I, at least five times a day, I say thanks to God. And you can do these same five. Uh, when, I, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I do before I do anything else, before I go to the restroom, before I turn a light on, I grind the beans and start the coffee pot. And that's my first opportunity to say thanks. I plug that in. God, thank you for coffee. I'm going to need this to get through the day. Thank you for coffee. Thank you for everything. That's one. When I walk into the office in the morning, especially on Sunday mornings, I, I, I stop outside and I look at the cross on top of the steeple. And I say, God, thanks for letting me be the lead pastor of this incredible congregation. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything I get to do today and the people that I get to minister to. Thank you for everything. Two. After worship today, we're going we're to decorate the church at 1 o'clock if anybody wants to come back and help. Shameless plug. Um, after we're done with that, I'm going to flop down on my couch and I'm going to watch the end of the Saints' uh, victory today. And as I drift off to sleep in my, my chair, I'll say, Thank you, God, for a great day of worship. Thank you for things that calm and relax me, unless, of course, the Saints are losing. And that's a whole different prayer. Uh, but that's great. This evening when we get the girls' plates ready for dinner and we sit down, I think, thank you, God, that we have food on our table. Thank you for everything. That's four. Then when I'm lying in bed, starting to drift off to sleep with my pillow propped up behind me, I've set the sleep timer on the TV. I'm watching old episodes of The Office. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for rest, a warm house, a comfortable bed. Thank you for my family and my friends. Thank you, God, for everything. That's five. You can do that each and every day. Here's what Paul says in our, in our Colossians passage. Darren, can you put that back up, the scripture from Colossians? And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. The next, next part of it. But let's read this part together. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. How many opportunities were there listed in that passage for giving thanks? Paul's describing for us how we cultivate Gratitude through, through, through speaking those psalms, through singing spiritual songs, by expressing thanks to God and Jesus Christ. And as, as we head into this Thanksgiving holiday, as we head into Advent and Christmas and everything that comes with that, I want us to be a people who are defined by gratitude, who live our lives with grateful hearts because we're cultivating a harvest of gratitude. 
I want to end today with a, with a video that someone sent me. Um, it's from a church in North Carolina. They went viral a couple of years ago. And some of you may have uh, already seen this. It captures the idea that everything is a gift from God. And that if you really start your day off thinking like that, that everything is a gift from God, you can cultivate gratitude. Have a look. Maybe not as obnoxiously, but what if we were that grateful and realized that all of the things around us are, are pure gifts from, from God? When was the last time you were that excited about the shower? <laughs> when was the last time you were that excited that, that the water came on? I, I remember when gratitude for water hit me. I have a friend who's a bishop in, in Kenya, and um, several times he's come and stayed with, with Brittany and I. And, and, he, he understands America pretty well. He probably understands it really well because Kentucky Fried Chicken is his favorite place in the entire world. And as soon as he gets off the plane, he wants a, a KFC, but it has to be one with a buffet because he doesn't want to mess around with sides. He just wants chicken. Um, we were still living in Cornell at the time, and the drinking water in Cornell was just awful. Um, so we had a, a water cooler with the big five-gallon jugs on it, and I watched Titus go to the sink and turn the water on and start to give himself a glass. And I said, no, 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 T, don't do that. That water's not any good. We, we drink from the cooler. And then I went, ah. Because I'd seen the water in Kenya. I'd seen the videos and the pictures and, and seen people bathing and doing their laundry and feeding their livestock and carrying their water six miles back to their village. And I thought, what a first world problem. And I remember just standing there and watching the water run out of the tap and thinking, I'm so grateful. That's how we begin to cultivate gratitude. You don't have to be as obnoxious as that guy. But just say, God, you've given me so much. And the, sometimes those very obvious things that are right in front of us are the things that we miss. When you put shoes on, when the light switch worked, and he didn't have to haul water six miles from the, from, from the water source to his village. When you run out and think the car is not warm enough, but it's there, and it's yours. That's how we begin to cultivate gratitude. Let's pray here.